Cool. Thank you very much and I apologize for this uh, slight technical issue. Um, to give you the, the full story, we were expecting to have uh, a different type of event, hybrid one, but due to the extreme bad weather conditions in Luxembourg, we had to switch to this WebEx only um, event. So I apologize for that and now we are ready to start. So um, good morning and um, or afternoon, depending where you are located indeed. Uh, my name is Florence Tenier. I'm a partner within the investment management practice of Arendt. And uh, before anything else, I would like to introduce you to the panelists of today. First of all, uh, Michaela Forelli, who is the CEO of MNG Operation. Uh, then we are obviously very honored to get Marco Zwick, who is a director within the regulatory authority in Luxembourg, the CSSF, where he is, among other, supervising investment funds. Thank you also to Yves Nosbush, uh, who is uh, Chief Economist Officer of uh, BGL BNP Paribas. And last but not least, uh, Peter Nelson, who is a Product Development Director at Schroeders. So uh, thank you all for being with me today. So this is the, the closing session uh, of, um, of um, our 2023 webinar series, um, which is the second vintage of a series of events and uh, webinar we wanted to dedicate to use its topic. For this closing session, uh, we wish to spend a little bit of time on the state of play of USITS, taking a little bit uh, some back and forward uh, looking inside as to the evolution to come uh, for this industry based on the macro um, type of uh, analysis. Please use uh, the, the, button, the chat button if you are attending this uh, webinar and um, if, if possible, if time allows, uh, we will uh, address your question at the end of this session. You may ask why to dedicate uh, specific events to, to USITS. Um, also, we do acknowledge uh, that uh, recently the growth of assets and the management is certainly coming uh, from the alternative uh, asset uh, classes, uh, while um, the growth of USITS might have had um, maybe a smaller pace. Still, there is a large portion of the assets and the management in the EU, and more particularly in Luxembourg, which is still lodged in the usage. Uh, based on uh, EFAMA numbers, uh, which have been published in last December, uh, at the end of the third quarter of 2023, there were 7.2 trillion of euro of assets lodged into alternative investment funds, whilst 12.5 trillion were still invested in usage. At Luxembourg level, um, this is also uh, the same reflection since according to recent CSSF data, as of September, uh, last September, USITs were representing a little bit more than 48 or 49% of assets under management in regulated funds. Since our firm is advising 40% of the Luxembourg fund market by offering an integrated approach of uh, different type of uh, specialists, dedicated to, to use its uh, feed and question, we felt consequently legitimate uh, to leave that focus to use it and the session of today. And I just realized that my slides are not uh, on the screen, so let me uh, check how uh, I can do that. One second. Okay. okay, that's it. So, without further ado, uh, as a matter of inter uh, introduction, uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, Eve to lead us through an overview of the macroeconomic situation of 2023, uh, and uh, hopefully we will assess how this may have influenced uh, the usage industry. So Eve, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that uh, I'm, well, I'm aware that there were some challenges, obviously, to the industry in 2023, but from a purely macro perspective, uh, 2023 was really a year that surprised to the upside. I think it's fair to say that at the beginning of the year, uh, most, uh, most economists, most uh, for professional forecasters were expecting a recession in the US and in the Eurozone because in the face of 
historically high, uh, quick and uh, large uh, increase in, in, in policy rates by the ECB and uh, the Fed, 4.5% cumulative by the ECB, 525 by the Fed, over a very short period of time, just over a year. And in fact, the recessions didn't really happen. So certainly in the US, the US has been remarkably uh, resilient. In Europe as well, Germany's had a small recession last year, but not anything very serious. The labor markets have been remarkably resilient. Unemployment is close to historical lows, stays close to historical lows, both in, in Europe and in the US. Um, weight grows very, very sustained, strong, um, just under 5% in Europe, just over 5% in the US. The real economy has been holding up well. Defaults have so far not increased by a very significant amount. And on top of the, everything else, inflation has been coming down uh, steadily, uh, so we could say according to plan. Um, core CPI in Europe is now uh, is now at three point four percent in December, and in the US, core PCE, which is the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, uh, which is a preferred measure of the Fed, um, was at three point two percent in November. Um, both coming down from obviously much higher levels a year ago. So it's been a surprisingly good year from a macro perspective. Um, that's really the, the backdrop, I think. Thank you very much for this uh, view and analysis. So indeed, I understand that it was not necessarily as bad as expected. Um, if we have a look on um, the, this graph, of, uh, which has been uh, issued by EFAMA, and which is related to some uh, data as of end of third quarter of 2023, um, we see that um, there is a relatively stable level of net assets for funds, USITS and AF, with a slight increase as compared to Q2, um, slight, slight decrease as, as, as compared to the end of 2022. But still, of course, if we speak about trends, much lower, obviously, than in 2020, which has been a, a year of record. Looking at the situation uh, in, in Luxembourg, uh, we see that at the end of uh, November, over uh, the last uh, 12 months, the uh, trend uh, and the volume of net assets, including usage, has decreased by 27 basis points, um, which show, um, again, a situation of assets and the management which seems, uh, which seems uh, relatively uh, stable, but of course, um, in, uh, in, in decreased uh, as compared to 2022. 2022. And um, if we, we have a, a further look uh, at uh, more granular statistics, I, I gather from EFAMA that uh, inflows, net inflows, uh, were much higher actually in the usage with uh, 29 billion of assets of inflows in Q2 2023 as compared to the net inflows in alternative investment funds, which may give a trend. Uh, and if we speak about uh, UCITS, uh, my understanding is that there might have been a um, decrease or, or outflows out of the equity and probably a switch in other strategies like money market funds, uh, obviously ETF, and we will speak maybe a little bit later on that, uh, with uh, multi-asset funds probably uh, being the one uh, suffering uh, the most. But these are numbers, and uh, these are numbers, and I would like uh, to hear what uh, the representative from the uh, asset management industry, Peter and uh, Michaela, uh, would like to comment. Uh, if I can make a, 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 a last uh, quote, uh, I got from an article which was published by Ignace that uh, out of 2,000 fan houses uh, with available data, 
uh, understand that 278,000 mutual funds um, and exchange traded funds record the largest outflows in the two decades as of uh, 2023. So it is sometimes claimed that investors took money out of the active funds as a result of ongoing disappointment about, uh, about performance and also cost to some extent. But this may be another topic of discussion. So Mikhail and Peter, um, this is not the same situation for everyone. Um, how was that situation being translated from a product and operation perspective? What is largely business as usual for you over last year? Or uh, was there an economic environment which has prompted some changes in your approach? Michaela, do you want to start maybe? Yes, thank you, Florence. And um, a, a good afternoon to everyone. And, and thank you, Arendt, for, uh, for hosting me and us uh, today. Um, I think that uh, the economic environment and the flow environment in 2023 um, prompted us to uh, focus the approach uh, in developing uh, more products together uh, with our main distributors and our main institutional clients. So we did uh, have, we did notice a change uh, uh, going towards uh, more solutions. Uh, uh, solutions can be in, uh, in funds and in new seats, uh, uh, but sometimes uh, uh, needed particular mandates or segregated accounts. Uh, in general, uh, we have come uh, uh, from uh, at MNG Investments, we have come uh, uh, from two years of, of strong growth in 22 and 23, uh, which we are very pleased about, particularly in Europe and here in, in Luxembourg. But last year, there was a really a, a a significant change uh, in the scenario, which is explained very well. And inflation and the geopolitical instability have been dominating the scene, uh, keeping uh, UCITS uh, clients concerned about investing in, in risk asset classes. At the same time, the high interest rates provided by the so-called risk-free asset classes, so money markets, uh, government bonds, uh, uh, and savings accounts, increase the competition to use it for us. There was also a, a strong increase in direct investments in, in government bonds in particular, and also uh, a lot of offering of, of structured and guaranteed products in the market, which went to compete uh, with, with use it. So at the end of last year, I think the, the figures are, are coming out uh, now uh, in, in the market, but I think only a few of the active investment uh, have uh, uh, which could leverage on, on high quality and long track records, uh, uh, were able to actually um, see significant inflows. Otherwise, we were uh, competing a lot, as I say, with, with savings, with government bonds, with direct investment lines. On the one side, I think you, you touched on it, Florence, Institutional clients uh, have been uh, prevented uh, to allocate uh, as much as the previous years to alternatives uh, in 2023 because of the so-called uh, um, denominator effect. Uh, and so um, we saw institutional clients coming back uh, significantly uh, into, into use its strategies, into traditional strategies, equities, uh, as well as credit, which I think boosted the numbers last year for uh, uh, the use its uh, play. Okay, so an encouraging view, uh, I would say, because we, we well know that retail uh, use its are obviously retail funds, but that institutional investor is, is a major bulk of uh, investors in this type of vehicles also, so probably an encouraging view from, from that perspective. And we will also maybe discuss a little bit later uh, the complementary, uh, if we can say so, with um, um, the retailization uh, uh, as, as globally mentioned, but merely LT fund and part of fund. But Peter, what, what would be uh, your, your comment on, on past year? and what you have seen in the market and your products? Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and I would, and good afternoon to everyone, I would echo a lot of what Michaela has said. Um, I think 
we are seeing that that kind of regime shift in um, inflation and rates and how investors have been thinking about their portfolio and um, with many clearly thinking about cash and deposit rates and being significantly high and trying to obtain that, that risk-free rate and then pulling their assets from um, more riskier assets in, in the market. That trend has certainly been going through for many houses across across the market and that's something certainly we, we've seen in places. Um, I think there, there are still some strong themes out there within risk assets that people um, wish to go into. Um, and we've been seeing kind of resilient pockets across the board. Um, but on, for the most part, most people, I say, looking for that um, relative safety um, of, of the cash rates um, and trying to go into that side of the market. I think to Michaela's point about you know, the consolidation and, and working with clients and co-creation, I think we've definitely have seen that as a trend. Um, and for um, investors in a, in a winner takes all situation, having larger mandates um, and looking to launch them with one chosen provider um, and then working in that co-creation environment to design the product together and um, suitable for, for their clients and, and their underlying clients and their products. Um, so that's definitely a theme that we've also witnessed in the market as well. So if I translate it well, I understand that uh, clients are definitely uh, looking for the added value that the um, offer proposition uh, can can be, and that uh, you you are probably um, directed more to tailor-made type of uh, strategies and products. Would that be uh, also a fair statement to 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 bring the, the added value to your clients? Yes, I think so. I think so. I think if it, you know, in the UK, um, we even had a, a savings product which was up at six percent over the course of the summer, um, which is just a, a very challenging amount. You know, a key competitor to our our use its risk asset funds. Um, that's, you know, for asset managers, that's a challenge um, that we need to overcome and make sure that the extra reward that investors are are going to have to put and the extra risk they're going to have to get there is matched um, by the return that they can get on the fund. Thank you very much. Uh, Marco, uh, we are very, um, very honoured to have you uh, on board today. And obviously, you are in a different uh, position. Uh, you are at the forefront of the market to some extent by approving new products, new substance, but also obviously um, looking and, 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 and being at the first uh, stage of um, restructuration, liquidation and other type of change of movement uh, in the market. So have you seen uh, also an impact on the overall econ from the uh, economic environment uh, in your day-to-day -day practice, I would say? Uh, have you identified a need for closer scrutiny in some extent, or even product intervention? So what would be your comment on, on, on what has been happening in 2023, if I can ask? Laurence uh, for inviting me first of all and also uh, good afternoon and good, good morning for everybody having joined um, to, to this conference. So first of all, uh, so just speaking about the economic situation, uh, a lot has been said. I, I, I would just said, say that if we speak about assets under management, it's always interesting when we look at the publications which are done by the CSSF on a monthly basis that we distinguish between market movements and uh, in and outflows. And I think the good news with this is, to some extent, when the figures went down, they were mainly related to market movements. When they went up recently, they were also mainly related to market movements. So we, we seem to be quite stable in, in some sense in, in, in terms of the uh, net subscriptions. Um, having said that, there have been outflows, and I think we have been transparent about this, with one very notable exception, which you mentioned before, which is the money market funds, for which for very obvious reasons in the current context, which is also given by, by central banks, uh, has, has uh, shown uh, inflows. So, so I think that's, that's the positive thing. Um, we see that the proportion of usage within the overall portfolio of our supervision has remained broadly unchanged. Having said that, we speak about still a majority of uses for Luxembourg. We see also that there are more alternative funds coming up, obviously, so the percentage is switching a little bit over time. 
Um, the other tendency which we have observed more recently, and that's probably also a question of cost management uh, operated by, uh, by fund management companies, is that there are fewer launches of new umbrellas, but within existing umbrellas, there are many more sub-fund structures which are uh, being released. And I think from an investor perspective or from a market perspective, it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, you tailor the sub-funds as you would tailor other types of financial products. But from a figure perspective, you see obviously that the, that the number of funds has decreased a, a little bit. So um, the good news is that um, in, in the last figures which we released, we speak about 5.2 trillion of uh, euros of assets on a management. Um, what we have seen in terms of, uh, of our work is obviously the number of, of new products coming, new strategies, or the, re or the revival of previous strategies. We see that uh, there is more emphasis on risk-adjusted returns, also from an investor perspective. Obviously, fund uh, issuers, fund promoters have gone this way to offer these type of products. We also ultimately aim at safeguarding the capital of the investors. I think that's also something which, which is important to say during a crisis. You see there is a more concern conservative behavior, especially on the, on the retail side. <clears throat> then we have also seen a continued uh, interest in ESG, which is something which I believe we are going to discuss. Uh, we also have seen that there have been changes in the way how uh, asset managers operate uh, their investment capacity. One good example being the innovation in technology, which is being used also to create uh, artificially, uh, artificial intelligence powered investment strategies. So this is also uh, something which we see. Uh, and then obviously, with the whole discussion around retailization, we see more and more uh, also the appetite for alternative fund structures, which I believe we are also going, going to discuss. And that would be mainly for Luxembourg um, a, a, a development in terms of part two funds and also LTIPS, which is obviously an, an important topic uh, for, for Luxembourg. Now, looking into all this and in terms of the investment strategies themselves, um, it's probably not a big surprise to see that we see more appetite for fixed income strategies again, especially uh, in 2023, where I think there was already an indication that, in, in, that, that, that interest rates uh, at medium or long term uh, may be uh, going down again, may decrease, which obviously makes this product quite attractive from both a price and also a price evolution perspective. Uh, we also have seen on the equity side, despite the fact, that, as you mentioned, Florence, there have been outflows, but we also have seen inflows and new products with respect to specific sectors. And this would be the type of equity products which would be exposed mainly to, um, to technology sector, to biotechnology, to artificial in, to, to the uh, to the sector of artificial intelligence and also cybersecurity and also pharmaceutics. So you see, there are some specific sectors which still benefit from uh, from uh, attraction from an investment perspective. The objective has been uh, to have stable returns in a quite volatile environment. I think we all share this, and this also means that we have seen that the number of of new ETFs. Uh, funds which have been launched uh, to specific sectors also has continued to, to grow. So I, I would echo what has been said beforehand. Overall, not the back picture, but it is a picture of stability. And I think that's what the graph also shows. Thank you very much for this insightful um, comment and analysis, um, which is um, very, very interesting. And Maybe a few a few additional comments from from my part. Uh, indeed, some kind of stabilization in terms of assets. Uh, and as you said, we do not necessarily see a lot of new uh, platform creation, but indeed um, uh, additional uh, attractiveness for existing platform which are building uh, additional products uh, to develop the offer they have to the existing clients. Probably in line with what has been said by Peter and uh, Michaela. And uh, speaking about uh, saving uh, investors' uh, interest, uh, we also uh, have seen in our day-to-day -day practice indeed a lot of uh, fixed maturity funds uh, with um, uh, an offer of protection to investors, uh, definitely. 
uh, and uh, speaking about um, the so-called retailization, obviously, when we look at the numbers, uh, we see a trend. Uh, I believe part two funds, which have been the vehicle of choice, um, aside ELTIF, have been very stable for many years, and we, we have been starting to see a slight increase. Of course, I, of course, as compared to the number of part two, it's still uh, uh, limited, but we really see an additional interest for uh, major market participants in that field and uh, wishing uh, to expand uh, that offer. And also, when coming from this liquid uh, um, world, I would say, uh, to leverage on the capacity of distribution capacity, uh, which you mentioned, and that we might also be uh, discussing a little bit as, a, as an element of, of further development. Um, I would be uh, pleased to hear uh, Michaela with uh, well versed in that in that uh, domain as to uh, the different way of, of distributing maybe but maybe let's let's keep that for uh, for for the uh, future um, uh, when we would have had the forecast if I can say so from from Eve. Um, you also spoke um, about um, um, ESG, uh, which has been of course uh, uh, an important trend, uh, not only. Uh, from uh, last week, but uh, since it became an obligation um, to to classify uh, funds uh, under uh, Article 8 or Article 9 or to stay uh, under the Article 6. And uh, we have seen uh, indeed important um, statistic uh, being uh, published recently uh, by PwC, which I would like to quote, when they say that um, ESG funds account for 67% of the assets under management of Luxembourg overall usage, reaching 2.8 billion trillion sorry, of assets at the end of June 2023. So uh, 67 of the assets under management of usage domiciled in Luxembourg are actually either Article 8 or Article 9. And on this slide, we also see that there have been uh, between 2022 and 2023, a massive switch towards Article 8 and to a lesser extent, Article 9. And um, I would um, be pleased to get the comment of uh, Michaela and, and Peter on, on that topic. Also, um, I understand um, a point which has been mentioned that also this type of uh, ESG consideration may be uh, less considered uh, due to an element of cost, which has been recently highlighted by, by ESMA to some extent. Also because some of them, and mainly the Article 9, might be deprived from some exposure to the um, asset classes, which have been the, 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 the best uh, um, the best performing uh, over the last period. Uh, but still, I would, I would be... And so the, the question is, is it... Is it really a trend which will last? Or, as some are mentioning, um, would we expect that um, the, the, the switch has been done massively, but then uh, people might uh, still look at, at, at core type of funds, if I can say so? So, Michaela, if you want to comment on that one, maybe? Yes, with, with pleasure. So, in regards to sustainability and the situation of, um, of the product development, if you will, and the distribution approach, uh, I think we, as in uh, MNG, but also a lot of other uh, industry uh, steam players, have been spending the last uh, 18, uh, 24 months uh, putting our product ranges in, in a shape, uh, um, both from a, a point of view of client demand on sustainability investments, but also especially in terms of regulation. And so we are, uh, um, we are seeing uh, these percentages that, that you quoted, uh, Florence. Uh, similarly, also in our house, we currently have 11 Article 9 funds uh, and around uh, 30 funds which are are, uh, Article 8 with, with a couple of additional funds uh, coming to become Article 8 this year, which also for us represent probably more than 70% of the book. So uh, that, that's been the situation until now. But I think as we launch uh, new, uh, new strategies, uh, we see it. Uh, 
embedded now in, in our standard process uh, uh, to have uh, a sustainability consideration and, and sustainability ESG principles in our range. So within obviously investment appetite of the fund manager, risk tolerances and, and so on. But uh, I would say now sustainability is embedded. We witness on the distribution side uh, different environments as we uh, probably all have read about uh, appetites very varying between uh, Europe clients and clients in the Americas or clients uh, in the Asia Pacific towards this trend. So there is not a solution that fits all if you wish. And now obviously uh, regulatory developments with SDR in the UK are also posing an additional um, factor into the equation of how we will cater for different uh, environments uh, in terms of, uh, of product vehicles and, and type of uh, um, levels of, of ESG and sustainability investments but to your question uh, point Leon uh, is this uh, something that is going to fade away as a demand uh, uh, we have seen uh, last year uh, um, products uh, uh, labeled sustainable uh, or ESG uh, rated products uh, uh, suffering a bit in flows uh, uh, and definitely because compared to the previous year where we had a, a very strong growth and uh, this is a, a trend last year that manifested itself uh, on the back of uh, uh, clients desperately looking for investment performance uh, um, and uh, this type of strategy is uh, uh, typically being a bit more defensive but also not focused on some sectors that last year were highly in demand due to the wars and the geopolitical risks such as uh, oil and gas for example so to me it's a, a contingent trend uh, of 2022 three that saw uh, this type of strategies more uh, challenged but over the long term i think it's now embedded that surely in the european distribution space uh, uh, the requirement of having sustainability principles uh, in uh, um, in how we invest and if i can ask you one additional question out of curiosity would you make a different assessment in, depending on the targeted type of investors sometimes we we hear a certain type of dichotomy between um, the uh, appetite uh, from institutional versus uh, uh, more retail type of investors. Is this something you have assessed in your analysis? I think there is a, a difference uh, between uh, institutional uh, investors' requirements uh, and retail investor requirements. In, in the institutional space, uh, we have... Uh, um, we have seen uh, the demand uh, for uh, uh, sustainable credentials uh, for a long time, both in the uh, traditional usage space, but uh, especially also in the alternative space. So I think it's more consolidated in, uh, in the due diligences. It's much more uh, of a with uh, the request from the trustees. Uh, and, uh, and it's uh, more established also in terms of, uh, of research, which is normal for professional investors. Uh, in the retail space, uh, it has been a, a movement uh, that really came from uh, um, philosophical approaches of, of the public that obviously see that climate uh, and other ESG considerations, uh, social uh, aspects uh, need to be at the core of what we do for, for the future and for, for our investments, for our future generation investments and so on, but it has been uh, initially less, uh, um, less strong because the, the, the distribution world uh, had uh, different uh, needs and different requirements. So yes, I see it differently, but I see um, the, the distribution world uh, coming more towards uh, uh, 
a, 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 a genuine request for sustainable investment and not only one de derived from uh, regulation. And just to say, I also see a, a difference in geographies. Mm -hmm. Europe has been at the forefront of uh, uh, sustainable investments and uh, most so uh, Northern Europe and the French speaking countries. Um, but uh, it, is, it is developing to a, a more standard level uh, across Europe as well. And as I mentioned before, America has been having a lot of debates about these topics uh, and uh, Asia Pacific is closer to the European view. Thank you very much. Peter, or do you want also to, to, to comment on that uh, trend for ESG? You, 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 you are um, at your firm uh, at the forefront also of that initiative, having, having switched massively to Article 8 and Article 9 uh, subfund, so you have certainly uh, an insightful view also to be shared. Yes, certainly. And, and just, just to touch on the points that Michaela was making, I think um, you know, there has been an, a, a large amount of time spent making sure that our fund range is in regulatory compliance as well. I think that's been dominating a lot of fund houses, certainly ESG teams, product teams and distribution, and really just the education piece around that and understanding what the, the lay of the land now looks like in a post-SFDR world. I think the, the point Michaela made about the kind of cross-border nature of these funds and the different regimes that we're seeing on the sustainability side, and particularly on a global basis, means that probably the, the use of cross-border um, promotion and marketing is probably as you know impacted as it has been ever. And certainly when we look into Asia and we see the different regimes coming up in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Taiwan, uh, in Korea more recently, certainly that um, ability to thread the needle and to make sure that our fund range is fit for purpose across all those jurisdictions and the varying different sustainability regulations that are coming into force is proving more and more difficult. Um, we're starting to see um, more of those Asian jurisdictions become more advanced in their sustainability. I, I definitely agree with Michaela, you know, Europe is leading the way, um, but those jurisdictions, particularly in Asia, are following. And we're seeing that you know, iterations of their regulation increase and then you know, that all flows down to the, the product itself and our disclosures within um, our prospectus. And so there's varying kind of patchwork quilts of sustainability regulations making it more and more difficult, certainly for product and ESG teams to make sure their, their products, their usage products on a cross-border basis are fit for purpose. I think on the flow side, um, we've seen um, more resilience in our Article 9 funds, I think, overall. Um, I think um, the, the stats maybe that hide a few things there. They are, uh, for the most part, largely newer funds um, and so may not have um, the outflows to lose that certainly some of the Article 8 funds have, have seen, particularly in this market with the performance challenges. Um, I think we would draw a nuance in Article 8 between those funds that have sustainability nomenclature and those that don't. And I think it'll be interesting to see with the ESMA fund naming guidelines coming into force, what that means for the market and whether that's a, a key disturbance event. Certainly we think our um, kind of sustainably named funds and article yet they have been slightly more resilient set against the, the backdrop of some outflows across um, those that aren't named within article eight overall. Thank you very much. And uh, obviously indeed one of the challenges in that area is, is, is definitely the the need of alignment uh, among uh, the different regulation, uh, but we are obviously at the inception, and, and we would need to to follow on on the on the future revolution. In that respect, Marco, do you want to add anything uh, in in on that other trend that you have already covered a little bit, or even on your regulatory action? Also, this uh, webinar is not deemed to be. Uh, necessarily uh, regulatory driven, but at least to give that overview, I, I'm sure the audience is always interested to hear uh, your views on, on, on where regulation or regulator is going in that space. Yeah, well, thank you. And and indeed, I, I think I can echo what uh, my colleagues have said beforehand. And uh, I think the statistics normally do not lie, huh? as long as you produce them yourself, as somebody will say. Uh, and the statistics show clearly here um, that there has been a shift from uh, Article 6 into Article 8 or 9. Uh, what we have observed was that initially there was a much bigger proportion of Article 9, but then uh, once we came to the deadlines, you know, uh, in, in terms of being compliant, we, we saw uh, actually um, a lot of houses uh, readapting, you know, and 
declaring more Article 8 funds, which then shows actually the, the increase also in your chart. And it's quite logical because there were a lot of discussions around legal definitions. Uh, and, you know, even though this is not a, a discussion around uh, regulatory topics per se, I think everybody knows about discussions on taxonomy around uh, SFDR. Uh, about interpretations, and actually we see that has materialized in a review by the European Commission, also about SFDR, because I think people have realized that there are things which are probably not working as they should be working, uh, and um, which can also explain then why you have some outflows, and, um, uh, and um, it could well be that people wait actually for uh, some additional clarifications which will come as part as, uh, of SFDR, but I, I always would caution everybody just to, I mean, we speak a lot about SFDR and product classifications. So all these are not labels, uh, and they should not be used as labels, and there is actually a discussion at the European level uh, uh, whether labeling uh, would be the answer to it or not. Um, our, our perspective in Luxembourg has always been to stick to European standards. We know that uh, there has also been an issue that uh, some European countries may have taken different views by having a local interpretation to, to rules, whereas we have always advocated to have a European answer to it, that we know it is not, it is not always easy to, to have that. But at the end of the day, uh, this is not just about disclosure, it's really about uh, what we do, what we promise to investors and uh, what what they get. And, I, I, you know, I would never take credit for a quote from somebody else and I cannot mention him because I haven't asked him for his permission. But I was recently speaking to a university professor who told me uh, something very interesting um, uh, in his view, based on current research, but the research is still ongoing, the, the question which we have to, uh, or the, the, the disclosure which we should make to investors investing into Article 8 and 9 funds is not so much uh, what do you expect as a return, but uh, the question could as well be what sacrifice are you willing to do on your performance by, by going into these type of funds, which is an interesting thought because obviously... Um, not just as a regulator, but also as, as a normal human being, I would expect much more uh, Article 6 to disappear in the future and to become much more ESG compliant, you know, because we, we all know that there are challenges um, which we are facing, which are outside of the finance world, but this is the finance response to it, and actually guiding people more into sustainable investments is something which is absolutely necessary but I think uh, there is also this type of additional research on the ac by academics, which is continuing and which hopefully will also provide some clarity because people speak about um, giving up some performance, whereas you can look at that on an individual fund basis, but it will be interesting over time, you know, once it becomes more mature to have a more holistic view about this sector and what it means. And let's also not forget in all this that we have, uh, of course, different types of investors. It was said before and by my colleagues, but we also have different ages of investors. And I think with the new generation coming, uh, I, I would not be very surprised if the demand for sustainable uh, investment is going to further increase. So what we see for the time being may be a slight decrease, or I would even not call it a decrease. It is a slowdown of the speed uh, which we had in terms of having these funds um, but i'm still optimistic that um, the investor demand will prevail and that uh, as a market we are going to get into the right direction and i make abstract all the discussions about legals here about uh, about wordings which need to be adapted it's just a trend which i sincerely hope is going to continue because it is necessary to continue in my view yeah, I took your message uh, from the legal perspective. We will do our best to be as clear as possible. And uh, we will not, of course, discuss today uh, what would be the consequences of, of, of not uh, being aligned with what has been promised in the documents, but which is also a, a, a very much um, a, um, appropriate debate uh, that, that we have and where we expect some position being taken by your commission, if not, uh, if not mistaken. Um, this is obviously a, a broad and, and very passionate uh, debate, and uh, we will probably need to look at the future. Um, where Eve, um, we will 
Um, we would like to, to get your, I don't know if I can call that prediction, because of course, if we were repeating that exercise in one year time, we might not quote you. I know it's a very difficult exercise, but at least we would appreciate if you could tell us based on your analysis and what you, you, you understand and gather from the market, uh, in which direction uh, we can expect to, to go. <laughs> It's indeed always sobering to uh, look back on the predictions from a year ago before you make the, the, the new predictions for the year. But maybe let me just maybe um, give you a general overview. I think the general expectation uh, is that the ECB and the Fed uh, will cut rates this year. Japan, obviously, a very different story, but the ECB and the, and the US um, central banks, central bank, are expected to cut rates if only for to avoid. Uh, an increase in, in real rates, because it, one of the key things to remember is that as inflation comes down, if you don't move the nominal rate, de facto the real rate increases, and de facto this means additional monetary tightening. So if you want to avoid additional monetary tightening in the face of decreasing inflation, you have to mechanically reduce the nominal rate. And so I think the general expectation is that this is going to happen both in Europe and in the US this year. Um, the median forecast today by um, by professional forecasters for the ECB is around 75 basis points of cuts this year. Um, in the um, in the US, we do have additional information information we don't have in Europe, which is the Fed governor's own forecast. It's the famous dot plot, and if you look at the, if you look at there, if the median forecast of the Fed governors, i.e., the people who actually set the interest rates. Uh, they are expecting uh, 75 basis points as well in the US, but the market is expecting significantly more uh, rate cuts this year in the US. So, um, so that's the central, the, the central forecast, the consensus, I guess, today in the market, uh, maybe twice as much as, as, as what the Fed is saying. Um, now, what could slow down these uh, cuts in rates? Well, I think the first thing, and this may also explain this discrepancy between the Fed's own forecast and, um, and the market's forecast for the U.S. Uh, rate cuts, is that, and I think this is also very relevant for the ECB, I think we, we should keep in mind that the central banks probably have a slight bias in the way they're going to approach this, which is very natural, because they, they really don't want to make a mistake here. They will, I think the mistake they want to avoid is to cut too fast, too quickly, and then to have to reverse. Uh, and have because if they see that they cut too quickly, too fast, um, too early, uh, they um, and inflation doesn't come down sufficiently, they might have to increase rates again, and that's certainly something I think they would want to avoid. So what this means is that they will probably have a slight bias for waiting a bit longer uh, than they otherwise would uh, to be really sure that uh, inflation has gone down, come down significant uh, sufficiently. And I think that's part of the explanation why um, why the, the Fed's own forecast is quite different from the market forecast today. So we'll have to see uh, where, how this plays out. Another reason, of course, that could slow down the, the decrease in interest rates if, is if we start seeing more of a price-wage interaction. Because as I mentioned before, wage growth is very high, so above 5% in the US, just under 5% in Europe. And for the moment, we haven't seen much of a feedback loop between prices and wages, but this could still um, happen, in which case, again, it would probably mean that core inflation would come down less quickly than, than people might expect, and that could slow down the, pay, the, the, the pace of um, rate cuts. What could increase or accelerate the pace of, of rate cuts is, of course, if we had a, a, most, a significant recession in, in, in either Europe or the US or both, but again, that's not the central forecast today, and there's nothing really that suggests that at this stage in the data. Um, in fact, the, the consensus is really a the consensus for soft landing uh, in the US and in Europe, and that's also really all the data we have seen so far. The data, as I said, are good at the moment, so there's no specific reason to think that uh, to think that it, things would go wrong, so uh, the consensus is a very positive consensus. Is that you know, growth, you, we're not going to have a uh, recession in the U.S. Maybe a slight technical recession in Europe, but not much. Inflation is going to continue to come down this year, and um, rates are going to get cut, and it's all going to go according to plan in a way. Now, of course, we, in history tells us, it teaches us that soft landings are, are very difficult to engineer. They often go, they usually go wrong. 
Uh, and so I think we need to remain wary what the risks are around this uh, central scenario for 2024. And I would might mention maybe two key risks for me. One is default risk. So as I said before, so far corporate defaults have not gone up significantly. But this is something obviously we need to monitor very closely this year. If you see so pick up in corporate defaults, and that would certainly be um, something that could derail this um, soft landing scenario. And then, of course, the most obvious one, but also the most important one, I think, is geopolitical risk. And um, you know, we have we have two major conflicts in the world. We have a number of very important elections this year that could um, could change the dynamics of, of certain processes. Uh, and things can change very quickly when uh, geopolitics change. I mean, just to give you the, rec the recent example that uh, I think we're all aware of is uh, with the tensions in the Red Sea, the, the, the cost of freight has basically doubled within, uh, within a matter of days. So things can change quickly, and I think that's very hard to predict. But again, if you look at the data today, the data look very good. So, um, so the central scenario kind of has to be uh, in the absence of any specific um, uh, evidence to the contrary, that, that we, 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 we are hoping just to have this uh, soft landing this year. That's what the consensus of the market is, I think, today. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we will certainly follow that closely and not quote you in, in one year time if, if, if it's not appropriate. Um, time is running, uh, unfortunately, and we are, we are uh, reaching um, very soon the end of, 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 of this discussion. Um, I would like maybe to, to ask um, first uh, Michaela and uh, Peter, um, with all that, uh, which kind of challenges or opportunities they see in a few minutes? And then if you all agree, uh, would be uh, pleased to hear uh, Marco's view um, about uh, what would be uh, his uh, priorities or the thematics uh, that we expect um, to be key for 2024. So maybe uh, Peter to start and then Michaela and then Marco, if you don't mind. Yeah, certainly. I think um, that inflationary journey and, and, and rate level that he was trying to chart um, so well, um, I think that that is a key bearing on what 2024 holds for us. I think um, depending on when the Fed decides its cuts and then the frequency of the cuts thereafter, that could shape the year materially. And um, so I think if investors are in high paying cash rates, uh, notice deposits, one year bonds, when they come to roll, really seeing what the rate is at that stage. And, you know, cash is a comfort blanket, even from the emotional side. And so seeing whether investors just want to stay in there. And of course, while the rates are higher, that reinvestment risk is lower. And so the comfort blanket stays. But if the rates were to come down, then it puts a, a bigger emphasis on that kind of risk return basis. And if they're willing then to come out away from their comfort and step into the, the risk environment and, and put into risk assets. I think that's certainly something we'll be watching closely over the course of the year in terms of, of flows. I think, you know, we talked about sustainability, but I think to echo Marco's comments, I think it will still stay high on the agenda and, and the priority, particularly on a, a global use of spaces. Um, and making sure our products are fit for purpose. And I, I do see opportunities in there, and um, particularly on the thematic side, um, on the climate side, there's some strategies that we have doing particularly well, and um, particularly stories around the energy transition, um, and then the more kind of generalist um, sustainable growth funds. Um, so I think it'll certainly be opportunities uh, and more of the same in that range. Thank you. Michaela? Perspective, I think the favorable macro context that uh, uh, Yves uh, and Peter were mentioning, I think it's really um, it's coming to fruition for fixed income, in particular for, for quality fixed income, because we have high yields and the potential of the rate cuts. Uh, so um, I see 2024 a, a, a strong year for fixed income to uh, come back to the fore and the attention of, of clients. We have seen already a strong demand for flexibility. So there is in this uncertainty, uh, clients want to go back and uh, delegate again choices within asset classes. Uh, for uh, equities uh, uh, like Peter, I, I think uh, the need for diversification in this high dispersion um, is is 
top, uh, top of the list, uh, and I think uh, thematics con will continue to flourish, uh, um, but also component, also uh, component or with, with, with an active uh, investment level and uh, uh, strong track record as well, uh, possibly defensive, which plays again back well to sustainability uh, themes. I think in the institutional space, we will still see um, a tailwind to use it or to traditional assets because predominantly I expect the liquid assets to be still in the interest of institutions, uh, uh, which, which comes back to, to the strengths of what we do in, uh, in USITS. Uh, again, um, strategies of particular uh, strengths and niches, uh, um, sustainable strategies and credit, and for Europe, I think particularly European uh, credit. I just wanted to mention that I see also um, a, a continuum on uh, uh, clients asking us to think together how to structure best uh, the investment proposition. I think Florence, you mentioned at the beginning fixed maturity products uh, and uh, um, uh, buy and maintain, uh, buy and hold, uh, all this type of, uh, of strategies will still be valid if we have a, a situation of high yield and, and potential rates uh, cuts coming up. Thank you very much. Marco, it's the last words for, for you in terms of... Oh, oh, thank you. What an honor. <laughs> so I think, well, obviously, I could not just bypass regulation here, even though uh, the circular is obviously not about regulation. But speaking about our priorities and about uses in particular, you are probably aware that there are discussions at the European level in terms of uh, eligibility. So that's obviously something to which we closely uh, contribute and also uh, where we monitor the outcome. We have seen all the discussions outside of usage around IFMD2. So um, there we will also see more happening uh, this year. And um, speaking about then um, uh, other types of investments on the alternative side, we haven't really discussed a lot about LTIPs here, but I think it's worth mentioning that it is one of the products which we clearly see from an um, retail perspective being being a good product actually to also possibly fit well into the whole discussion about uh, retailization of, uh, of funds and making the choices uh, bigger for investors in terms of, uh, of asset classes. Um, linked to this are obviously all discussions around liquidity management for open-ended funds. That's something which is not going away. You have seen in December the publication by IOSCO and by the Financial Stability Board. So I think it is another topic uh, which is very close to, um, to, uh, to, to, to our hearts, especially also for usage, because there typically we speak about open-ended structures uh, more, more broadly. And then uh, I would also like to mention sustainable finance once more, but from a different perspective, because we have started a common supervisory action at European level with respect to ESG, uh, which was started last year, which is going to continue in a phase two this year. And then uh, maybe uh, also speaking about the uh, investment strategy, which is an also an, 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 a package which has been presented by the current commission. It has to be seen, I mean, colleagues were speaking about um, votes in Europe and in some jurisdictions also outside of Europe, where we also are going to have a new commission this year, probably, or very likely. So I think it's also to see a little bit what the priorities will be. Uh, then uh, one area which probably is a little bit underplayed in, um, in, 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 in our sector still, is Mika and Dora. So especially Dora, uh, I think Mika, a lot of people would be in, involved if it comes to investing to crypto assets, but Dora is more the Digital Operational Resilience Act, which probably you all have heard about, and for which also we have a deadline January next year. So there's a lot of work which will happen on, on that side. And last but not least, please allow me just to mention the circular 0277, which uh, is now celebrating 22 years. Uh, it's not going to celebrate 23 years, that's a promise. So we are uh, ready um, to uh, issue, hopefully, by uh, in, uh, still by the end of the first uh, quarter this year, 
the update of that circular, which which I believe is also awaited by, I hope it is awaited by a lot of you. So we will speak about this technical topic probably in a, in a different forum. And then making, um, apart from all these changes, uh, just one word also about technology um, and increase of technology, which we do at the CSSF by creating new possibilities, interfaces uh, for markets to send data to the CSSF, but also by, um, and that's something which you probably have seen, changing a little bit the way or adapting the way how we supervise, changing the concept of long-form reports, which I can tell you if you want to change something which has been there for many, many years is a big challenge. So something which we have done uh, last year, uh, transforming it into self-assessment questionnaire by the boards, uh, followed by a control report by the external auditor. So so I think you see is also the way how we supervise. Um, uh, and we are not unique. I think a lot of people do this. Uh, there will be more supervision also based on data. Simply. And the challenge is to transform data into meaningful information. And that's obviously uh, also one of our priorities for, for, for this year. So it's a long list. Uh, so sorry to be that long. But um, the five minutes which I took are nothing compared to the huge workload which we have and which you will also have in the market, as I fully acknowledge. Well, thank you very much. It's indeed a long, a long list, but uh, nothing probably that we were not expecting. Uh, so um, at least we see uh, we see where where the focus is, and and, and it, it's quite clear. So indeed, we have we have reached the end of uh, of uh, this session, and I would like um, to thank, uh, of course, uh, the participant to this webinar, but a special thank to. Um, the four of you for having been uh, so generous in your in sharing your views and uh, expectation uh, in a very open and insightful manner. So I would like really uh, to thank you on behalf of Arendt and uh, our participant to this webinar. And it reconforts me in the in the fact that uh, it's worth uh, paying attention to your seats, and we will certainly continue in that direction. So we'll certainly uh, reconvene this type of uh, event uh, from time to time. So thank you very much again uh, for having been with us today and apologize again for the slight technical issue we had at the very beginning, but we had to manage with some unexpected situations. So thank you very much and I wish you a good day. Thank you.